Good afternoon and morning, wherever you are. This presentation by the Rocky River Public Library is to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United States giving the independence to the island republic of the Philippines. My name is Dr. William Bailey, Associate Professor Emeritus from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. I moved to Rocky River with my family about three years ago. Here you have Douglas MacArthur, one of the most controversial, no, probably the most controversial uh, generals in the United States Army over the past hundred years. Here he is walking on shore in Leyte, looking somewhat uh, unhappy because he was hoping that he would not have to walk in water and get his pants wet. But this was a very important posed picture for him to be shown returning to the island of Leyte where he was preparing to liberate the Philippine Islands, all 7,200 of them from the Japanese. I like to point out something about Cleveland when I teach uh, about World War II. And one of those things is the Cleveland class cruiser. These had uh, eight inch guns and uh, if you'll notice, they have uh, about eight of those or more. And uh, they have five inch guns. They have 20 millimeter cannons, 40 millimeter cannons. Uh, th these ships were very important and served in the Pacific. In addition, there were 27 of these Cleveland class light cruisers uh, who were uh, commissioned and used throughout the world and World War II, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, and served very important in combats across the nation, the world. As America looked forward to the possibility of invading Japan and causing the surrender of the Japanese military, the question came up whether they should attack Formosa or recapture the Philippines. The goal was to take an island location so they could use it to bomb all the Japanese home islands. And initially the decisions were made to basically focus our energy and attacks on eastern China and take Formosa back from the Japanese. However, and Admiral King, who was in charge of the Central Pacific Command and all of the Pacific Command at one time, said, we're going to ignore and bypass the Philippines and we're going to take Formosa because that will be somewhat easier than we can bomb the Japanese homeland islands to oblivion. Um, by the time we moved toward the Philippine islands, we had already captured some islands in the Gilberts, the Marshalls, and the Marianas. We had taken back Guam and Wake, which had been our possessions as a result of the Spanish-American War. Um, and so it looked like amphibious assaults were going to be easier than we thought because we had done so many. Some of those assaults had been done by the Marines, some had been done by the Army, but it was a learning curve and both were learning very well how to accomplish the goal of taking an island. So we needed to take the Philippines from MacArthur's point of view because it would cut off the resources, particularly oil, to the Japanese homeland forces. And it would prevent their navy from sailing, prevent their submarines from moving, and it would basically shut down the island's production of military armament. MacArthur stood in the way of everyone because he had said he was going to return and he chose Leyte as the place where he would return. And as a result, MacArthur got his way. Good, bad, or indifferent, this was the decision made by Admiral King and all the Navy and the Army when they looked toward the destruction of the Japanese military. It really became dependent that we get those in order to keep, take back our reputation since they had been an American colony 
for 40 some odd years or almost 40 some odd years. So we had to do it and so we struck out the process, struck to accomplish that goal. Now from 1941 till 1944 when we in Invade the Philippines, return to the Philippines, there had been a lot of technological changes in the U.S. Navy and Air Force. First of all, we had developed radar, much more sophisticated radar that could be put on our ships and in our aircraft. As a result, when the radar first arrived, we didn't know how to use it very well. But the Japanese were very, very good at night combat at sea. We particularly got terrible defeat in our Navy forces around Guadalcanal and Salvo Island where four cruisers were destroyed in one night. But we learned how to use radar, how to use it for targeting, how to use it to detect aircraft, how to put it on aircraft so we could find the enemy aircraft and shoot them down. In addition, it also made us prepared to fight the Japanese at night. And we also had put it on our aircraft for night combat also. The Japanese Air Force had started off with the fighter in the Pacific, the Zero. And it had shot down hundreds of American British uh, planes with quite ease from 1941 till mid-1942, if not going into 43. However, they were not replacing the Zero with newer aircraft and, it, and part of what was going on, it was taking them so long to produce pilots. America was turning out pilots in eight weeks. They were taking six months to turn out a pilot and they didn't get the big picture, but we did. So we improved our aircraft and sent them to the Pacific and as a result, in particular, the, the Navy fighter, the Hellcat, and this, the Corsair were far superior to the, to the Japanese Zero uh, in speed, uh, guns, etc. One of the problems of the Japanese Zero was that it had no self-sealing gas tanks and it didn't have any armor around the cockpit. For the, to protect the pilot, while our aircraft did, self-sealing tanks and pilot protection. So you could hit a Japanese Zero early on in the war with several rounds, five, six, seven, eight incendiary rounds, and it would blow up. In addition to the Navy fighters, we improved and sent out new fighters for the U.S. Army one of which was the, the P-51, the Mustang. Uh, it did fly in the Pacific. It flew from Iwo Jima to Tokyo and back. A long, long flight protecting our B-29s. Then we created the Black Widow, which was an excellent aircraft. Um, also a twin engine aircraft that was very successful and uh, not too well known at the time. Our heavy bombers improved. We went from the B-17 to the B-24 and then to the B-29 Super Fortress. In addition, we created one of the most important things in the war, proximity fuses for our anti-aircraft shells. During the Battle of Britain, it was typical for 20,000 rounds of ammunition to be fired for every one aircraft taken down. That sort of remained the case up until 1942 when we had developed the proximity fuse. It was as hidden in secrecy as was Trinity or the creating of the nuclear bomb. In addition, we improved on decoding ULTRA, the Japanese naval code, which was in, important at the Battle of Midway. We knew where the Japanese were going to be so we could hit them and we were successful, but it got better and better and better. And we then knew, began to determine where their submarines and their um, ships were going to be hauling troops, ammunition, etc., and supplies. So these technological developments made our taking of the Philippine Islands easier 
though it was not easy in any case. Here's a discussion of radar. Here are the men in the, in the targeting room. Um, significant improvement over time. First used in England in the Battle of Britain, improved daily. Uh, there's an excellent little PBS movie about it. I highly recommend it. One of the finest Navy aircraft, not too well known, however, I think, is the uh, Grumman F6F. Uh, this had a horrifically powerful engine, 2,000 2, horsepower. I could outclimb, outturn, etc. Shot down more than 5,000 Japanese aircraft. And it did this by losing only 270 of its own aircraft, or a 19 to 1 to, to one uh, kill ratio. Here is the whistling death. Not only did the uh, Corsair uh, was an excellent fighter plane, it was also an excellent aircraft for targeted light bombing. One of the problems with this particular aircraft was um, it was difficult for the pilot to see over the long stretched out engine as he was trying to land on an air aircraft carrier. However, they were successful. This uh, air is the same aircraft used by Major Gregory Pappy Boynton that's in the TV show Black, Baba Black Sheep. I highly recommend looking at some of those old TV shows of the, of the Corsair flying in the Pacific. This aircraft went on to fight in the Korean War where it actually downed a MiG-15 jet. It was a very successful aircraft. In addition, the P-51, after it got a new Rolls-Royce engine, was superior to anything in the air, both for the Germans or for the Japanese. So we used it to escort our B-29s to Japan because it had a range of 1,500 miles. Of course, it putted along as the B-29s were relatively slow. Um, so imagine being in one cockpit for more than eight hours or 16 hours. In the very first combat, the 96 B-51 shot down 21 Japanese planes. It was a far superior aircraft to anything the Japanese could put in the air. And of course, the Boeing B-29, which was first flight, was in September 1941 in, at Wichita, Kansas. Um, almost 4,000 of these aircraft were built. It was a very touchy aircraft and uh, in the sense it was difficult to fly because it, had, it was so complex, but it also was difficult to uh, maintain and there were some real problems with the engine overheating initially. But notice that it did have uh, machine guns on board, 20 millimeter cannons, uh, one man could operate up to four of these guns by himself at a, at a, a location within the aircraft. Uh, it could go up to 5,600 miles without a bomb load, but up to 3,200 with a load. Um, 10 to 14 men on each aircraft. Initially, this uh, bomber was used to bomb standard targets with standard bombs from 30,000 feet over Japan. That changed later. Here's that proximity fuse and uh, it would allow the the people on at the anti-aircraft gun to sit it in such a way that it would explode prior to hitting the aircraft a certain distance away and hopefully the debris would take down the plane. The first large-scale production of this was in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, a General Electric plant that made Christmas tree lights began producing proximity fuses because of their skill with these small parts, as you can see, uh, inside these uh, uh, shells. We had broken their code, and in preparation for this, we had decrypted it. We were disseminating it much faster. Um, we knew what we were doing. And as a result, we uh, were prepared 
to find out what the Japanese were preparing to do on the island. But the, the crypto system for the Navy was different, but we knew what they were saying too in their code. It was JN25. From 19, June 1944 to September 1945, the Battle of the Philippine Islands began at sea. And it began with the Battle of Philippine Sea in June, followed by four other naval engagements, which in ag aggregate are called the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And then the armies landing on Leyte from October 1944, followed by the Battle of Mendro in next year, and finally, we moved to Luzon and captured Manila. The Battle of the Philippine Seas was a carrier battle. The ships did not fire at each other. But as you can see, there were numerous ships involved in this process. Admiral Raymond Spruce was in charge of the American fleet, and Luza was in charge of the Japanese fleet. Hundreds of aircraft were involved, hundreds of ships and men, almost 200,000 sailors were involved. So here you see the American ships moving toward this location, Task Force 58. This is its, its route. It also is bringing some aircraft from uh, Guam. And they meet here and the Japanese fleet flees uh, because of its losses and they began moving toward the the main back home islands and uh, I recommend that you watch this YouTube uh, it is uh, excellent presentation uh, we defeated the Japanese we shot down hundreds of their aircraft and sank many of their aircraft carriers as a result it was clearly an American victory and you notice up here is Iwo, Iwo Jima, and its relationship to the Japanese islands up, up in the northern part here. Two waves of U.S. aircraft destroy aircraft carriers and aircraft by the dozen. Uh, wave one, we just knocked down 300 Japanese airplanes and sink two carriers, but we lost 29 aircraft. The Navy personnel involved in it called it the Marianas Turkey Shoot. The second launch of the Japanese plane came in the late afternoon, and the it was at the very edge of the potential flight of our aircraft that took off from carriers. And so we were flying at dusk. We found them. We attacked them and turned back toward our ships as the needles on the fuel gauges went to zero. In addition, as we returned, um, the fleet itself turned on its lights. So as of the 185 crews that were out there, 143 crews were recovered. Uh, it was called the Mission Beyond Darkness. This was a great challenge to our Navy fighters and flyers, but we succeeded taking the risk and again taking down aircraft carriers and aircraft by the dozen. In addition, two submarines sank two carriers with almost 100 Japanese aircraft on each ship. Here is the uh, Caravelle sinking this command uh, ship, uh, killing 1,650. 1, Here is Abercor taking down another aircraft carrier, over 1,200 lost. Results of the Battle of the Philippine Sea, again the Marianas Turkey shoot. The loss of more than 3,000 uh, Japanese pilots and sailors. Here is a Japanese plane trying to hit the carrier. Here is a gentleman who comes back and he shot down six aircraft in one mission. Again, 
200,000 sailors, four separate engagements. Um, it was the first battle in which kamikaze aircraft were used. It was the last battle in the Battle of Leyte Gulf is the last place that battleships actually fire at each other. We had to cut off the Japanese supply of oil. And there was no single commander for either the Allied or Japanese fleet, which led to some confusion and some problems that was later on. The American fleet had more than 300 total ships. There were about 68 or 9 maybe uh, Japanese. We had destroyed their ships to the point that they were going to face a very difficult problem in fighting our Navy. And we had had a lot of skills. This hybrid carrier bar battleship means that there was a few planes on board and they'd put a deck on it. It was a very poor uh, situation. Again, we had the numbers on our side. At the same time that this battle is beginning to take place, it takes place primarily because the Japanese have Operation Sho. The idea was the Japanese fleet would attack from three different locations onto the troop ships and sink the troop ships off of Leyte uh, landings. Then they would turn their fire and their cannons of their battleships and such on the troops. That was the goal. The idea was, again, that if they destroyed all of those troops who were at Leyte, sitting in Leyte Gulf and troop ships, we would surrender and ask for a conditional surrender. We'd already told them we want an unconditional surrender, and they were not willing to put up with that. So this was the final show for the Japanese fleet. The northern fleet that came toward the islands had no aircraft on board. We knew where they were, and Admiral Halsey wanted to get in on the big show of sinking these carriers. So he leaves Leyte Gulf and heads north three or four hundred miles. He sails northeast, leaving behind a very small group of ships. The central fleet of the Japanese had five battleships, two carriers, and some heavy cruisers. The southern fleet was the smallest of the three fleets, with only two older battleships. We had left behind a small group of naval ships, mostly escort destroyers, to protect the landing craft and troops. There was also a couple of what's called escort um, carriers, which were very slow and carried very few aircraft, and most of the aircraft they carried was not designed um, to carry lots of weapons. The single battleship, the Yamato, weighed more than the whole of the Taffy 3 group of ships. You take all the ships in Taffy 3, weigh them, and this one Japanese uh, battleship outweighed them. So this is the day in preparation what was going to happen. Uh, Halsey takes off to the north and the Japanese come in here. This is the northern fleet that has a Yamamoto coming down to take on where we are landing troops. The southern force and Sigmund's force come in basically the same way. So there's two groups here. It was the Southern Force with the smallest of the three and will be defeated in this battle number two. Battle number one occurred because basically our some aircraft hit them with some submarines and then the real big battle occurred here uh, off of Samara. So the Battle of Paul Sawan Passage occurs, and here we destroy um, a couple of their cr cruisers, and it was because of our uh, submarines we were very successful. 
and as a result of damaged ships, many of them returned back to their base. Pearl Harbor revenge occurs in the Battle of Surigao Straits, the last battleship in history. Here comes the Japanese, and they're hit at night by a group of small PT boats firing torpedoes, not very successfully. And as they approach where the Leyte Gulf is and all the troop ships, the American ships line up and cross what the T and begin firing. And as a result, um, at 3 a.m. in the morning, the Japanese lose the battleship that sunk in 40 minutes. Um, the torpedoes fired by the destroyers were, were very successful. At 4 a.m. in the morning, using radar, the West Virginia fired its 16-inch guns at 13 miles, hitting, hitting the, their battleship directly. And the, Missis, the Mississippi fired its last battleship servo, uh, salvo in history. It uh, sank the primary ship uh, battleship in 20 minutes. The second battle group joined. Two, two of their cruisers hit each other in the night. Um, American casualties regrettably were 39 dead one damaged ship and one PT boat lost where the Japanese lost several thousand dead two battleships and several cruisers in this battle of this particular uh, it's a funeral salute to the Finnish era of naval warfare battleships will no longer rule the sea the battle off of Samar I highly recommend you uh, go to YouTube and, and watch that particular video again. The greatest book about it, as far as I'm concerned, is The Last Stand of the Tin Can Soldiers. Here is the Japanese fleet coming down, and all they have are a bunch of escort carriers. They have a couple more destroyers, and... Uh, that's all they have against four battleships, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers. Um, these ships turned uh, to attack these destroyers and escort destroyers. Basically, these uh, escort carriers, which have very few aircraft on board and can only do about 18 knots, turned and ran because that's what they needed to do to avoid being destroyed. As Samuel Elliott Morrison writes, in no engagement in the entire history of the American Navy, more gallantry, guts, and gumption in those two morning hours between 7.30 and 9.30 off of the island of Samar. Six small escort cruisers, three small destroyers, and four destroyer escorts head for the Japanese fleet head on. They're met by four Japanese battleships with 18-inch guns, six heavy cruisers. The Japanese are seen only 20 kilometers away coming at the Taffy 3 at 30 knots. The escort carriers turn and head south at 18 knots and begin to launch their planes as best they could. Some of the aircraft were launched without any ammunition on board or bombs or rockets. At the same time, the destroyers turn north and head directly toward the battleships. The, each Japanese ship had created shells with colored dye. So when they fired a shell, they knew where their shell landed. Here is one of our escort destroyers uh, making smoke to hide the escort carriers um, and shells the, the size of cars exploding nearby. Here we are firing torpedoes, most of which missed. Occasionally one of our torpedoes would hit a Japanese ship. So 
despite the fact we had several aircraft attacking the ships, basically um, they did nothing. At 20 miles, those 18-inch guns could reach the carriers. The, the destroyers had to get within 6,000 yards of the Japanese ships before they could for, fire a torpedo and they fired those torpedoes and yet they were very ineffective. So here they are using five and six inch guns against an 18 inch guns. Again, the escort carriers were slow. The Japanese are coming at 30 knots. These are going at 18 knots. They zig and zag and they're hit by these 18 inch shells and begin to sink. Meanwhile, the destroyers get into the Japanese ships firing as best they could with their pea shooters and they're beginning to be hit by the 18-inch guns. Somewhere in the process, the Japanese era Katora lost courage and turned everyone back to the north and ran away from Taffy 3. David had defeated Goliath. There's no doubt in my mind that this was one of the most important battles of the war and one of the places where American sailors showed their gumption. Later, many of the taffy tree carriers would be uh, sunk by kamikaze aircraft that was land-based. Here is one of those uh, aircraft carriers uh, after a kamikaze strike, the San Lo. It was hit by one uh, kamikaze that exploded its bombs and torpedoes and um, it sank within 30 minutes. It was a disaster, but they were involved in the Battle of Samar. We invade Lady Island was considered an easier target than Luzon or Mindanao. Lady was the anvil in which we hoped to hammer. But at the same time this was going on, we knew the Japanese would reinforce these islands with troops, tanks, and all they could get there from China, from Formosa. So the Battle of Leyte itself, we had about 200,000 troops and some Filipino guerrillas. And we had 65,000 um, troops for the Japanese. On invasion day, we invaded in two different locations. We cleared pillboxes and caves. The, the Leyte Valley itself was cleared after killing 3,000 Japanese. Numerous fanatical kamikaze charges would uh, occurred, but um, it was a difficult battle. This is where we used lots of flamethrowers, both the flamethrowers that were carried by individuals and flamethrower tanks that we had developed to burn the Japanese out of their uh, locations of defense. The Japanese wanted to hold, but they could not do so despite transferring 34,000 troops and supplies. And they had air raids constantly attacking our troops. Uh, our reinforcements were held up to some extent. Two of the battles specifically on Leyte are called Breakneck and K Lake Ridges. Intensive battles went on in the Western Islands. We did a great pincer movement, and then a terrible typhoon, typhoon struck uh, the island. Uh, here are American soldiers and uh, Japanese dead uh, being recovered from these ponds. We should be thankful for the, the Filipino volunteers to getting ammunition and food and water to our troops, uh, using in some of these cases this buffalo. Uh, the logistic problems were a disaster, situation normal all fouled up, or snafu. Battle of Shoestring Ridge, um, 
an amphibian tank battalion put out to sea, leapfrog south across the coast, came on board, and a surprise attack. One night, the Japanese made a surprise attack on an airfield. In addition, they landed 250 tr paratroopers and airplanes. And those Japanese troops of the 2nd Raiding Brigade were destroyed as they landed and came out of their planes. We shot them to pieces. So Leyte was very tough nut. And we had, here's the place where we, we dropped some paratroopers. It was a, a very difficult uh, fight. And, but basically we captured the island. We went into mountain combat that was very similar to fighting mountains in Europe and the Alps. Um, and learning of the seizure of the last port open to the Japanese, MacArthur said all resistance had ended, but that's really not the case. Japanese continued to fight as, for, as up until December, uh, and actually a few up until May 1945. This is an excellent book talking about the, the combat on Lady. I highly recommend it. Our casualties were about 3,500 killed, 12,000 wounded. Um, of the 49,000 dead Japanese, 80% of those died of starvation or disease. Again, if our logistics were screwed up, theirs were much worse. So we turned south from Leyte. Here's Leyte up here, Pemindanao. And we attack with about 10,000 troops. We land at various locations. It's not heavily guarded, but it is at a f lightly occupied by elements of the 8th Division of the Japanese. And we push them back and take the island in a relatively short period of time because of so few troops. Uh, despite that, uh, we still have almost 150 killed and 81 wounded. Uh, we do capture 15 and, and 375 wounded soldiers from the Japanese. We need to land-based fighters and bombers for the Battle of Luzon. So we build and work very hard at building air bases, both on Leyte and on Mindanao. Um, and remember, this is the time the kamikaze attacks are beginning to occur. And the USS Nashville is hit by kamikaze, killing 130 men on board almost immediately. The total number of casualties caused by kamikazes was over 10,000. Here is the Bunker Hill. 400 killed, 350 wounded. Here is a Judy doing a, su a suicide bomb on the Essex. Sorry about that. That's... The Japanese sent almost 3,000 kamikaze aircraft and cherry blossoms. Sank 34 ships. Um, I highly recommend the movie Away All Boats. I can remember that as a child, uh, a story of what was happening on the various um, ships as the kamikazes uh, attacked them. Almost 5,000 Allied sailors and soldiers were killed or wounded. We did a good job with radar detection and uh, telling people where they were, and the aircraft barrages were put up, but still 14% survived to hit a ship. And of those ships, when they were hit, almost 9% sank. Here you have a photograph of a Japanese aircraft coming in, hitting here. It would have gasoline and bombs on board. I would suspect most of these young men um, would not survive that particular attack. Divided into three groups, this group of 150,000, this group of 30, this group of 80. Almost 260,000 Japanese faced our troops in defensive positions that have been being built over the last three years. The general knew he would receive no support, but he wanted to take out as many American troops as possible. 
they had few tanks. They knew their tanks would not hold up against the Shermans. So they basically withdrew into the mountains as well into Manila to fight a battle of attrition. Kill as many as possible and go down. So 10 U.S. divisions and regiments saw action. It was the largest military campaign in the Pacific. There were more American troops there than involved in total in our campaigns in North Africa, Italy, or Southern France in the European conflict. It was a very tough fight. We landed and they had retreated into the island to their protection. And we basically took the same position that the Japanese. We came down this valley toward Manila. We also landed troops here and here, all with the goal of taking Manila. And we basically turned back what few troops, so the Japanese came in here. We held some uh, reserves and MacArthur waited basically out here on the ship. Um, again, MacArthur and the other army commanders were in conflict on what to do. Kruger wanted to move into the mountains on both sides of the island. And MacArthur said, no, ignore the flanks, go to Manila. Go around them, bounce off them, but go to Manila. And so when we landed, we made inroads very quickly, moved very quickly in the island, and decided, well, not decided, they took the orders from uh, MacArthur. The road to Manila was very, very, Manila was very, very difficult. Uh, they had tanks and mines and such. They blew up the bridges and roads. They blocked our advancement any way they could. And as we got closer and closer to Manila, it was almost as if they thought of that as a Tokyo. We captured Manila in February. And one of the goals of that was to free the American prisoners at this prison and this prison. There are more than 7,000 men, women, and children in that prison had been held there from 1942 to 1945. Hundreds had died of starvation, and they were dying still of starvation. So it was street-to-street -street fighting. In addition to street-to-street -street fighting, um, the Japanese refused to give up. This is a recently published book uh, called Rampage. MacArthur, the Japanese general in the Battle of Manila, more than 100,000 civilians were killed in Manila in less than a month. In order to take Corregidor, we landed parachute troops. Over a thousand troops landed, several thousand also came in from the sea. The Japanese were deeply dug in and it was a long and vicious battle. Here, we were looking down on our ships landing here on um, San Jose Point um, on Corregidor. Here you can see the parachutes of the individuals who had landed previously to take the island. Um, in addition to this, there was the Battery Smith Armory, a night attack by 500 Japanese Marines came at the Americans and two companies or about 180 men, maybe 200 men, stopped the Japanese landing force from breaking through and getting to uh, the ships and men on the beach. Um, of the 6,700 Japanese troops on the island, we took 19 prisoners who were unwounded and 50 who were wounded. We put 7,000 troops on there and almost, and a little bit over 200 were killed. Here is the ceremony, which also can be seen on YouTube. This is the same flag that we showed being taken down 
uh, when Corregidor surrendered in one of the photographs of four or five Japanese troops around taking the flag down. Here we are raising the flag after having captured uh, Corregidor. Luzon itself was difficult. 8,000 Americans died with 30,000 wounded. But again, Japanese casualties were extremely high. Mostly again from disease and starvation. It was not over when the Japanese surrendered on 15th of August 1945 after the Emperor said, we surrender. Um, they refused to surrender. We actually saw, they kept getting people out of the jungles of Lausanne until 1974. We were criticized for overemphasizing Manila and allowing its destruction as a city. The Pearl of the Orient, it was called. Afterwards, it was laid bare. So we faced the decision after fighting so hard in the Philippines and later in Iwo Jima and later in Okinawa, what did we expect when we went to the Japanese homeland? We expected a million American casualties alone. And as a result, we dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is the Manhattan Project explosion in New Mexico on July 16th, 1945. So we conclude with the Republic Day of when we gave the Filipinos their islands back. They're no longer a colony. Here they are taking down the American flag and raising their flag.